thank you very much for this kind introduction, which probably I didn't deserve. Um, uh, I'm not sure that I have much to say about the future of chips and electronics. What I was working is an academic research very far from the electronics industry. It's essentially about uh, uh, some quiet revolution in material science is going on, and I'll give you a perspective on this, what's going on with new kind of materials, which I, graphene is one of those, and uh, uh, people called graphene wonder material, so there are many of those. So let me start with kind of a very broad perspective. If you look around yourself, all objects you see around the three-dimensional height, length, width, and we live in three-dimensional world. If you try to find something which has less than three dimensions, in terms of material science, it would be very thin or very narrow uh, objects, you won't find those. And the reason for this uh, is quite simple. Uh, essentially, on this video, uh, it was shown that uh, uh, if you put carbon atoms together, they don't want to go together at low temperature. You need to put uh, high temperatures, then atoms start to merge together making some kind of arrangements. Initially, at nanoscale, it could be lines of atoms, it could be flat sheets of atoms, but as you progress putting more and more atoms into, into the black box, as it should be on this video, uh, everything gets a three-dimensional architecture. Essentially, growth of low-dimensional materials is forbidden in our three-dimensional world, and for this there is a hundred years his history coming from Pyrrhus, Landau, Neumann Wagner, Kosterlitz, Staulis, and so on. Essentially, vibrations are so violent in low-dimensional space for one- and two-dimensional objects that they destroy this order, and only order possible in three dimensions. So you wouldn't find uh, low-dimensional objects for this simple reason, unless they're very small. Uh, forbidden in, uh, by theoretically doesn't mean uh, you can't make it. And the simplest way to look at it, uh, you start growth from a three-dimensional material, which is no problem at all, say, on this uh, image, you see, okay, what it, what it is? Cooking salt, crystals of sodium and chlorine, together rows of atoms and molecules, and you can imagine after the crystal has been grown, then you can extract an individual atomic plane. This is not forbidden by any powerful theorems, laws of, uh, physics and mass and so on. In principle, you can imagine that after extraction, if it's a finite size, say one square meter or something like that, it's not infinite, and our room temperature is so much lower than the temperature at which originally crystal was grown that it's possible. It turned out to be possible it took us to 21st century to realize that, and we have done it in quite simple experiment, which nowadays called scotch tape method. But the original idea was to figure out how very thin pieces, in my research area it's called mesoscopic uh, uh, pieces of graphite would behave. No one managed to grow those, those uh, thin films of graphite, so we wanted to make it thin. Eventually, after all sorts of tries for maybe up to a couple of years, 
there was an extremely simple method of doing this, scotch tape. You take scotch tape, you attach it to the piece of bulk graphite, pull away the scotch tape, and you see this rubbish left on the scotch tape. This has been done by thousands of people for decades, because this is the standard way of to investigate graphite. Surface of graphite can be done, made extremely clean by pulling away rubbish, and people studied this uh, uh, graphite, an interesting material per se, very important for nuclear industry, studied in detail, very important for atomic force microscopy as a reference sample, many, many times. Surely millions of times this has been done, and people usually throw uh, scotch tape into a little bit and study this uh, bulk graphite, clean surface. Okay, they probably didn't later realize that probably they uh, threw away their Nobel Prizes with this piece of graphite. We did it differently. We look what is left on the scotch tape. Uh, if you look at the microscope, light shines from the back of the script and you see rubbish on the surface. Some pieces of graphite in optical image are dark, it's thick, it's essentially metal, light doesn't go through. But some pieces are transparent and it immediately tells you that those pieces are extremely thin. The thinnest one here, probably a couple of nanometers uh, thick. No one has before us made so thin pieces of graphite. It was kind of a eureka moment. We got thin pieces of uh, graphite. Very happy with that. Could study uh, this uh, uh, intention to obtain thin pieces of graphite to make quasi two-dimensional objects were there. It took another couple of years to make big enough pieces like this one. You see here on the image, it's a crystal. There is not a single defect in this flake, which contains billions of atoms, uh, not a single vacancy. It's one atom thick. It lies on the surface of silicon oxide. It's visible on the by the naked eye. And you can employ all powerful techniques. We have at our disposal transmission electron microscopy, atomic uh, uh, force microscopy, scanning tunneling microscopy, and so on to prove that it's a, a perfect uh, monolayer crystal, essentially two-dimensional stuff in terms of material science. You can't man uh, manage anything else. So we can do two-dimensional materials. So, all right, we have shown that theory was not wrong, but theory didn't consider a possibility of post-growth extraction of atomic planes out of crystals. But so what? I would be not speaking today here if it would be the end of the story. It seems to be an extremely simple structure, chicken wire made of carbon atoms and so on. But over the years, the next three, four years, we started looking at the properties of this material. Of course, it's the thinnest material you can imagine, large surface area. No one expected, actually, that it would be the strongest material ever measured, as people put it. You have to take into account that it's only one atom thick, so, but you can poke at this material with uh, your hair, with a, a match, and it still withstands all those abilities. You can't do two-dimensional gold. Gold is not strong into molecular for interatomic forces enough to keep it existing at room temperature. Thin gold melts 
at room temperature into clusters and so on. It doesn't happen with graphene. It uh, remains as strong and even in suspended state, it's a membrane, all I showed before. It's stronger than diamond, it's stiffer than diamond, and there is a whole range of different properties, some of those, uh, especially electronic part. It's uh, the work by our group in Manchester, which we discovered there, but I don't have time to explain every property, but the biggest thing we probably found out, which no one expected, is that when you take a piece out of something big, out of, say, chunk of uh, wood, it's still a split of wood, a flake of wood, and you expect that something a part of a bigger thing would have the same properties. So that graphene would have the same properties as its parent material, graphite. It turns out to be not the same because properties are very different. And uh, you will see later why, why it is so different. Uh, that was the biggest surprise. Uh, the Nobel Prize was actually given probably mostly for electronic properties of graphene, how electrons behave inside. Uh, I'll, I don't have formulas in my talk, so, well, except for this slide, apparently. So let me explain uh, uh, what is so unusual about graphene. When we are talking about material science, insulators, metal, semiconductors, we usually use whatever, classical physics or quantum mechanical physics, Schrodinger equation. On the, on the slide, uh, you put additional terms and you essentially, uh, with all those additional terms, this is condensed matter physics to describe properties of all materials we know. But if you are particle physicists or astrophysicists, another equation is more similar, uh, is more familiar uh, to those people. It's Dirac equation, again, with additional terms. You explain what happens in accelerators, neutron stars, at least in, in first approximation. Where graphene comes into the play, it's uh, uh, electrons moving through the crystal lattice of graphene, they mimic uh, Dirac equation. Electrons are now called electrons, they're called Dirac fermions, massless or massive, also there uh, in physics of graphene. And this is very accurate mimicry. So the first, when we, some, a couple of years after initial isolation of graphene, uh, we found out that everything is described by Dirac equation. Initially, we and other people start doing experiments which were quite well known in the uh, uh, community for ultra-relativistic physics, particles community, but those experiments uh, couldn't be done, say, in CERN or whatever couldn't be performed on Earth, not in thousands of years, uh, because for, for the lack of one or another reason. Uh, this is a cartoon which I usually use to explain unusual properties of graphene, and let me start with this one. I don't need to explain you what happens with your car if you drive it into the wall. If you are familiar with quantum physics, if you live along uh, uh, the laws of the quantum world, you also know about quantum tunneling. Part of the particle probability goes through, part is there, but you can always stop your particles you're in the quantum world by building high and wide barriers. If uh, particles behave according to the laws, the same laws of the Dirac physics or electrons behave within graphene, then however high or wide barrier you make, 
you can't localize your particle. They go through all the barriers through. In, uh, because Christoph asked me to do it more scientific, this is for people who studied quantum physics uh, uh, on the left, it's uh, particles reject, uh, is rejected by the barrier and it goes through for the case of graphene. If you like to take it to another level, not the final one of the formulas, but in terms of how we illustrate formulas in one of uh, my papers from 15 years ago, essentially you have electron and when it goes under the barrier, it matches everything. Momentum, energy, spin of incoming electron. Or you can consider electron under the barrier converts into the positron and then exiting the barrier, it converts back into electron. That's Klein tunneling. Electron does not use this barrier because this conversion is essentially perfect. So the experiment is, has been done many times um, these days using graphene and this is property which you have to take an account in any, in any uh, electronics or whatever you do with graphene that you Essentially, it explains why graphene is so conductive because whatever impurities you put on, on the surface, they cannot stop or apply gate uh, to imply voltage or concentration there. They don't stop electrons from propagating. Both good uh, in case of high transparency, high conductivity, but bad in terms of making transistors in this case. Uh, another example, which also comes immediately about after three, four years of studying graphene, is what actually, I shown you the picture of graphene, what actually you see when you see, uh, when you watch graphene. Here is a membrane, it's a small piece of membrane from 15 years ago, at that time, uh, we could make only small pieces, and you see that graphene is gray, bilayer, two layers, monolayer graphene, but it has a remarkably strong absorption. It's 2.3% uh, of light is absorbed. Between you and me, there are billions and trillions of molecules of air, and light goes through without anything here, one, one atom absorbs that, one atom thick material absorbs 2.3% of light, and graphene is gray. It absorbs at all frequencies uh, nearly the same amount of light. Then you need a little bit theory, a little of mass. That's why physics is good at to describe everything by equations and you'll figure out that 2.3% is actually given by funda all fundamental numbers. It's essentially pi multiplied by the fine structure constant. And you can guess uh, why it should be related to the fine structure constant because what happening, light shines on graphene, graphene couples with electrons which behaves in kind of uh, Dirac equation with relativistic light and fine structure constant. Another name for this is electromagnetic coupling constant alpha 1 over 137. No one knows why it's this particular number. Uh, my work was mostly about uh, uh, focus about electronic properties and I could be speaking about electronic properties of graphene. Uh, we're still publishing in, in glossy journals uh, every year something about unusual ab about electronic properties of this material, but I think it would give a big disservice for uh, if I concentrate only on electronics and do not describe how unusual graphene with respect to other properties. 
So that's an, uh, another example based on my own research, but it's not about electronics. Graphene turned out to be most impermeable material we actually know. That was quite a tricky experiment. Uh, uh, putting a graphene, perfectly sealed graphene container and looking uh, how uh, atoms permeate inside this material. Uh, it's all done in the lab, but the outcome of this uh, experiment was that uh, through a micrometer area of graphene, we couldn't detect even a single helium atom per hour coming through. That's uh, the best leak detectors which are produced in academia or in industry. They are few bill few billion times less sensitive than it's done in, in this particular experiment. Experiments, this is probably as much as uh, uh, one atom is per hour is extremely high sensitivity. Theoretically, essentially, it would take uh, a lifetime of the universe for one atom to go through this kind of mem membranes, uh, but we couldn't detect it. And the reason for this is that carbon atoms are very densely packed and uh, there are not, there is not a single defect in the whole membrane. This is why it's so impermeable if you compare this with traditional material, steel or glass or anything like this. So this kind of introduction in telling about unusual properties, but probably more surprising uh, is the next experiment, again about permeability of graphene. If you have a single sheet so impermeable, then you think if I'll make a brick wall out of this material, it would be also impermeable. And uh, there is so-called graphene oxide, which likes to make this kind of brick walls. And it's very easy to make. You, you can do this essentially at home to make very large sheets of graphene oxide, 10 nanometers, they could be very thin, and they're impermeable. So the idea was to do the same experiment, but okay, on a macroscopic scale, and we found that uh, helium does go even through 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers thick membranes of graphene oxide. No surprise here because we're dealing with a single layer of impermeable. We try different g gases and then, I think it's about uh, less than 10 years ago, uh, well after the Nobel Prize, we surprisingly found that you put water inside and heat it up and you see steam go through this uh, uh, graphene oxide membrane. So super impermeable to helium and super permeable for water. Actually, water vapor doesn't even notice that this, the stopper is there. It goes through like a steam. Uh, I usually leave people wonder how it goes, but let me explain for this audience how it's happening. So graphene oxide, it's not just graphene. There are some functional groups attached to the surface, and they make this distance between uh, individual graphene sheets, about 10 angstroms, one nanometer, and th those serve as water capillaries. There is very little friction, so water goes very quickly, condenses inside those capillaries, is exposed to water vapor, and goes through very quickly, quicker actually, despite the tubes are one nanometer, it goes quicker than water runs through your water tap in a bathroom. So that's explain why water vapor goes through, but if you remove water vapor and leave it only to helium or in low humidity to any other gas, water goes off, 
the capillary shrink, essentially graphene sheets goes together and nothing goes through. So, so dramatic and unusual properties you can find in graphene. My last example about graphene is a work of last year, for example, graphene as uh, we call the philosopher's stone. Okay, uh, if you, uh, it's not the same philosopher's stone as a Harry Potter, but uh, much uh, before that, you know that people for wanted to convert lead into gold, for example, and it was a big uh, aim. So, in a sense, in our case, instead of lead, we used e-waste, electronic waste. Don't need to explain what it is. Uh, ask the previous speaker how much NVIDIA produces this one. <laughs> so, uh, sorry for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what we literally did, we uh, dissolved uh, uh, it in aqua regia, and this gives a liquid which contains all sorts of metal from copper to chrome to anything else, uh, but plenty of uh, gold within, within this liquid. You push this liquid through, as see on this video, which fortunately plays these times, and uh, you see that it becomes goldish, and those are graphene flakes at the bottom. Uh, you put more, it's more gold, separates nothing else, only gold extracted very efficiently, about two grams per uh, one gram of graphene being present, uh, and then you burn essentially over a uh, kitchen fire uh, this filter, and you extracted gold out of this one. Uh, it's, uh, it's specific, these catalytic properties of reducing uh, ions into a neutral gold are specific to graphene. If you try to do this with graphite or few layer uh, graphene, it doesn't work. Graphene, only graphene becomes, uh, becomes catalytically active. It's completely different from the parent material. Graphite is known as probably one of the most inactive inert materials uh, which we know more, more inactive than Teflon, PTFE, and so on. Right, uh, that's uh, a part of the story, but graphene is only one of those new kinds of materials, and uh, a lot of attention was on graphene, especially on electronic properties, but Already uh, 2005, we have shown that you can use the same scotch taped uh, technique to extract other two-dimensional materials for uh, while it was the gold mine of uh, looking for interesting properties of graphene. No one was interested in, uh, in other materials, but uh, Eventually, we and other people start looking into those. Now we know probably uh, about thousands of different two-dimensional materials which exist under ambient condition, do not melt or uh, segregate in nanoparticles, as I mentioned about gold. And people are interested in properties of those materials, what they can be useful for. And this is a very big area of research. These two-dimensional materials has beca have become. Uh, this is what we do these days. If you have uh, different materials with uh, two-dimensional materials, monolayers or few layers, we start asking about 10 years ago uh, what you can do wi with those kind of materials. This should be a stack, actually, it didn't uh, play properly, but essentially you can make a stack all of those materials on top of each other, create a three-dimensional material, which is impossible 
to be created in nature, it's artificial materials, and you ask yourself what properties of these materials could be. It's like playing Lego game, but instead of Lego pieces, you, you get those pieces of different materials. There are different arrangements. More lately, people are twisting, and we ourselves twisting this also another another handle to change properties, not only a sequence, but crystallographic alignment of different areas. All this is one of the most active research area in condensed metaphysics and, uh, and uh, material science. This is an example of stacking different uh, layers of graphene and boron nitride called white graphene to create a material which is actually essentially undistinguishable on at the cross-section from, uh, from graphite or boron nitride. Why do we do this? In electronic industry, people make heterostructures, uh, for example, different ways, molecular beam ep epitaxy. You can do the same in, uh, in our case. So there are two pieces of graphene, you use them as injecting electrons, inject electron hole, and light goes through, and you get uh, LED. Typical ideas as LED, the difference from LEDs which people use is that in our case, this heterostructure is made by stacking rather than molecular epitaxial growth. Not yet on industrial scale, but we we are going into there with pieces of these days you can grow two-dimensional materials uh, uh, using all sorts of streaks. So this might be coming eventually. Uh, people are very optimistic about what comes, what possibilities are. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical. Uh, as usually about what people try to sell, but uh, uh, still a lot of going on. Ten years ago, we couldn't even speculate about applications. Okay, everyone speculates. Uh, our colleagues did, and we too. Uh, but uh, um, these days, uh, there are plenty of graphene available. It can be produced in tons and it is produced in many, many, I don't know how, hundreds of tons per year and it's produced in square kilometers uh, if necessary. Uh, so uh, speculations are more justified as uh, especially among academics. Uh, imaginations often runs wild with possible graphene applications. I'm not going to tell about those because there are hundreds if not thousands of possibilities which has been considered. Uh, let me go into what we already have. Someone recently said, uh, probably exaggerating, that you walk for five minutes from the place where you are and you go to a shop and surely within a radius of uh, one kilometer you will find some uh, products which contains graphene as uh, an important uh, uh, element in this one. Let me, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a CEO of a company to uh, uh, to pump up uh, applications and so on. Let me just uh, tell you that probably at the moment the most important applications of graphene as a very effective cooling technology, for example, for computer chips, uh, distributing its very, its record thermal conductivity and so on. Huawei uses it to cool computer screens, but uh, it's also widely used to cool LED chips. While cooling this for the same intensity of light, uh, you decrease power consumed. For me personally, uh, kind of very persuasive was one that one of uh, companies in China uses this cooling technology with the following 
uh, modus operandi. They go to a local government and say, you have an old uh, LEDs in this region for several blocks. We put a new LEDs completely for free, but we get, uh, as a profit, we'll get in return all uh, electricity savings for the next 10 years. That's modus operandi. That tells you how much energy graphene cool LED uh, can, can, can save. And there are already a few hundred towns, don't know uh, how many streets in China, which are uh, littered by this technology. Uh, other kinds of applications I don't want to talk because it's not about the future of chips and electronics, but you know, for the last 20 years there was a, a kind of a, a big dream uh, of at least researchers who were working on uh, uh, electronic properties and uh, Samsung put it uh, on video a few years ago uh, it's uh, essentially because the materials are cheap and trans uh, sorry, uh, thin and transparent. You can imagine uh, variable bandable. Oh, why, what's going on? Uh, variable bandable electronics based on this one. I don't think uh, graphene would be the major player. It might contribute not only for cooling but. Uh, for kind of uh, contacts uh, instead of copper and aluminium previously and copper these days. Uh, people consider that, but uh, as I said, that there are many other materials, some of them semiconductors, which do not show Klein tunneling, which behaves more or less normally, but they are seen high mobility. You can make uh, transistors which are less than nanometer thick, there are no problems uh, which suffer silicon which when you try to minimize it. People are working this. The major problem is to grow, actually people grow a few inches, uh, those uh, so-called uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. Uh, you need to go to industry, you need uh, this that big, uh, similar to silicon chips, but uh, uh, quite a few companies working on this, Samsung, some Chinese companies working on this quite intensively. So I don't know whether it happens or not, but this is one of the dreams and people push it and one way or another material uh, permeates into various industries, one of them uh, semiconductor industry as well. Remains to be seen. It's like with quantum computers, but probably chances are high a bit. Uh, uh, so my last slide, I was quick. Uh, uh, five minutes, which you probably, most of you would appreciate, but it's quite mini <laughs> five minutes shorter. So in terms of science, yeah, uh, it's one of the hottest areas, essentially. it's. Uh, reshaped many research areas, including my own areas. In terms of applications, it's very first humble steps, but uh, we do see this uh, going through in various many, many uh, different products. Uh, I'm most excited, for example, so-called concretine, when putting a few, uh, a fraction of percent of graphene in concrete uh, with respect to cement uh, enhances uh, strengths of uh, uh, concrete by 10, 30 uh, percent, which a lot of savings in terms of energy, in terms of CO2, and I would never thought that a fraction of percent can um, make such a dramatic difference. So we'll see where it all goes. Thank you very much for your attention.